investigative work, I invite you to go along with me on regarding God's nature. I just took two words, slow and anger, and these are in the Bible together just a few times. It might vary on different versions. I think it's 8 in the King James, 9. In the New King James, and it's usually referring to God, and I want to go to those instances where it's referring to God and His nature. The first time we see it referenced, not that it's the first time it happens, because this is a reference to something that happened to Israel in the wilderness, when basically we, because that's who Israel represents, is mankind and, and our nature, the way we are, in response to God's kindness. In Nehemiah 9, starting in verse 16, it says, But they... And our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness. And did not forsake them. He did not forsake them. They suffered the consequences of their poor behavior. That is true. But it wasn't because God did something to them. He did not forsake them. He did not forsake them in the wilderness. And we now do similar things. We choose religious leaders. We choose religion itself. These false leaders. To lead us back. Or turn us back to bondage. The bondage that Paul talked about when he referenced, or made reference to the law, that the law is bondage. In Galatians 5.1, he makes direct reference to it, but all throughout Galatians, it's a good book to see how he points out that the law is our bondage. It is not our freedom. We get freedom from the law. The law was there to drive us to freedom in Christ. So, on that notion that he's slow to anger, that's not the way we see him, at least not commonly, most people seem to see God as a very wrathful individual who is out to hurt us, but he is ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. I think we need to look at this, look at him through a different lens, and we would see the things he does and says are not always the same. He responds in anger, he says certain things, like he said he was going to destroy them once, and then Moses pleaded for them. I think he probably knew Moses would probably plead for them. I'm not saying he reads everyone's minds and he knows everything everyone is going to do. But was he really going to destroy them again? And I don't mean he said it because he was making empty threats, knowing he wouldn't carry it out. I'm just saying he felt free to express himself with his friend Moses. He knew he could say certain things. And he was confident, apparently, that Moses would say what Moses said and ask for mercy for them. But if he didn't, that is, if Moses didn't, God would have had, would have been justified in doing what he said he wanted to do. I think that just goes to the freedom God has to be someone who thinks and considers and does and sometimes doesn't do. I had to check my veggies, they're cooking while I'm teaching here. Moving along here, in Psalm 103, verse 7, it says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. Now you can say that's two different things. He, he showed his ways to Moses, because Moses understood him and could receive the understanding of God and why he does these things. He he made known his acts to the children, but they didn't understand him. So they just saw it as acts. They saw it as actions, as things he did, great and powerful and awesome and all that. Whereas Moses understood him more as a person. And that's why he would say something like that. That's why he would ask God to have mercy. Not because he was judging God or saying God was being mean. I think he understood that God, you are justified in doing this. They are just backstabbing you with all of this. They don't trust you. They don't believe in you. You've done all these things. And they just look at you as a bunch of acts, as a bunch of 
good deeds or whatever, and, and when the good deeds run out, so do they. That's, that's how deep they are. That's the depth of their, their care and concern about you as a person. All they care about is when are they getting their bread, when are they getting their comforts, when are they getting their protection. So he made known his ways to Moses. So him and Moses had this relationship and his acts or his actions to the children. Verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. And I see this as the writer, in this case it's David, he is saying, well, be like Moses. Be like Moses. The Lord is merciful and gracious. I know what Moses knows. I know his ways. He is slow to anger and abounding in mercy. People, it's more than just knowing the things he does and the stuff he provides. It's so much more than that. There's this merciful and gracious God who is slow to anger. When you're slow to anger with a stiff neck and rebellious people, that says something so much about you. As a parent, you've probably had to deal with this. If you are a parent, or as a human being, you've probably had to deal with this. And a lot of us have had to learn how to deal with stiff-necked and rebellious people. People who have no thankfulness. We all have different degrees of success with this. Sometimes we respond in kind and we're angry right back at them. And sometimes you just say, no, I just got to show some patience with this person. And maybe they'll learn because you realize you, you have been like that or worse. So, not because he has been like that or worse is God merciful and gracious, but because he embodies mercy and graciousness. That is part of the person of who he is. That's why John said, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And that word for came by just basically means he created it. Jesus created grace and truth. He is the author of grace and truth. So he is grace and truth itself in action in the world. Moving to another verse in the Psalms. Psalm 145, 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. Verse 9, The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. This is another thing. It goes to attitude. The fact that you exist, the fact that there are resources in the world that you have access to, that is God. That is God. The fact that life is hard and you have suffered, that's not God. That's the nature of the fallen world and what we do. And we are all contributors to that. You may not personally have done the things that have been done to you, but still, you are a fallen person and you have caused your share of the damage. You have brought harm to other people. We cause harm as, a, as part of the course of life. That is what we do. And this is a, a description of the nature of God. You could, you could say the Lord only is gracious and only full of compassion, always slow to anger, and always great in mercy. That's our God. That's who He is. So we can be happy for that. Not so that we can condemn ourselves or each other. We have our nature. And we all can have our fellowship, our connection in this perfect one. Who loves us and has all this great mercy and kindness and tenderness towards us. Finally, to Nahum 1.3, which is what I mentioned in a short this morning that brought this all about, my desire to talk about this. And in Nahum chapter 1, we see the contrast here starting in verse 2. It says, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. Who would he avenge? The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Now I contend that his enemies are those who hurt his people. Because you can't hurt the Lord directly. You can only hurt him by hurting his people. So that's why he reserves his greatest wrath for the enemy of God and man. That's our mutual enemy. So he's not talking about those who don't follow the law perfectly, or even those who deny him, as long as they turn towards him and embrace him and his kindness and his truth. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. 
and will not at all acquit the wicked. The first half is what I want to focus on, like I did in the short. That part where it says, and will not at all acquit. They add the word wicked. In some versions it just says, right out, it just says, he will make sure he punishes everyone who sins, every sinner, which is all of us. So, I don't believe that's what it's saying at all. I don't believe what it's, say, it's saying that. And there's a version that says this in a clearer way, and that is the Brantons, or the, the Septuagint, which reads a little differently. The Lord is long-suffering, that is, slow to anger, and His power is great. And the Lord will not hold any guiltless. Now this, I believe, is consistent. He will not hold any guiltless. There is none of us who are guiltless. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need His mercy. So it's not that He is going to punish everyone. He is going to make alive those who believe in the truth of who He is, that that is our God and Creator, who came here to take away the sins of the world, when we believe that, His taking of the punishment on our behalf is something that we get the benefit of. Yes, we deserve it. We are not guiltless. But we become free from that guilt by believing in His willingness to take it for us. So now we can live free Knowing that we deserve that, but not from the standpoint of shame, but from the standpoint of, I'm a fallen creature. Fallen creatures sin. That's what we do. In order for that to be reconciled, the Eternal One, the Eternal Creator, who is before everything, before sin, before me, before life, before everything, had to step down into this world and take upon Himself my sin, all sin. He had to do that once and for all. The Eternal One can do that. The Eternal One did do that. He knows I'm guilty. But because He wants to have a relationship with me, and He wants to be with me forever, He took away my guilt. He held me guilty. The price had to be paid. He just stepped in and paid it. He didn't wait for me to ask. He didn't wait for me to figure it out and add up the score and realized I needed him, he just did it. And I have since cried out for his mercy, that is for sure. I have his mercy. So I don't have to constantly be asking him to do something. He did through his very blood. That blood was shed through the eternal spirit. That's what it says in Hebrews. He did that one time. And that is something to be thankful for. That's why as a non-religious person, a person free from the bondage of religion that He freed me from, He freed me from that bondage, I can live thankful now. Not thankful that I sin, but thankful that when I do sin, it doesn't damage my relationship with Him. It doesn't separate me from Him. He does not leave me nor forsake me. And it's not according to my performance, it's according to His perfection. He obeyed perfectly. And then on top of that, He gave His very life. So that through that shedding of His blood, through the Eternal Spirit, and my faith in that person and what He did, I can now have that life in me forever. So that goes hand in hand. He is great in mercy because He is slow to anger. That is a choice He makes. He made the choice. And even when He is angry, he still has a mercy and a love and a kindness and a patience that outweighs all that. That is on your side. That is here for you. To care for you. To keep you. And to save you. And to never let you go. In Jesus name. Amen.